This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and what is thin and light and, well, ThinkPad kind of sexy 14-inch display and Intel 8th generation KB Lake RCPUs? Well, it is not the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Carbon 6th Gen that we just reviewed last week. This is the Yoga Ink Eternal uh, alternative, also with the HDR display, 500 nits of super-duper Dolby Vision color saturation coming at you, but this one does the yoga thing. Touchscreen, obviously, no matter which display option you choose, and Wacom AES Pen. Exciting. We're going to look at it now. Well, here they are, two siblings separated at birth, right? And then brought back together again. You can see how similar the Carbon is. This is the X1 Carbon 6th generation to the X1 Yoga 3rd generation over here. The 3rd the generation Yoga has a slightly bigger footprint. That's to make room for the 360 degree hinges. It's also a little bit heavier. You know, we're talking some grams. We're not talking about kilograms difference in weight, but it's going to be a little bit heavier because it has that hinge design going on. But otherwise, you're talking about pretty much the same laptop in terms of the internal specification. Intel Core i5 and i7 8th generation KB Lake R CPUs, including vPro CPUs available. With both of these right now, if you want to go to 16 gigs of low power DDR3 2133 megahertz RAM from 8, you have to go with the vPro CPU. I I don't know why they do this, just to drive us crazy, right? And you get PCIe NVMe fast SSDs, standard Intel UHD 620 graphics. You get the idea. All the same internals in both of these, Intel 8265 AC Wi-Fi. So the big difference here is some of you just want a traditional laptop with or without touch, because the Carbon X1 is available both ways, or you know you definitely want a convertible. You want to be able to spin this around 360 degree word and turn this into a tablet or do presentation mode. And then there's the pen that comes with this too, which is a handy one, Wacom AES, that typical ThinkPads lives right over on the side, right here. It's removable. It charges while it's in the silo. Now you can get a bigger pen. Again, it's Wacom AES with 4,096 levels of pressure sensitivity, but this is the one that you'll always have with you and you probably won't lose. So for that, it's just fine. And you can get Lenovo's ThinkPad Pro Pen or you can get the Wacom Bamboo Ink Pen. Both are compatible. So, fundamental difference right there, and now we're going to go on and cover just the yoga. So pricing is a fluid thing with Lenovo. For those of you who follow the ThinkPad lineup, when a new product comes out, typically it's quite expensive, and then they have discounts and sales and all this sort of thing. And like I said, already the X1 Carbon that we reviewed last week has come down in price, and so too as the Yoga 3rd Generation, which is a good thing because these are expensive products. and Expensive enough that with the HDR display, they were flirting with Surface Book 2 price territory, and that's a dangerously high price place to be, even if you are a business kind of product where, you know, the company's paying, not you, so it can be okay. Anyway, it starts at $1649, which is just a bit about about $100 more than the carbon version of this. And the, the big news here is that the HDR display is price dropped. Now it's only $170 more to get that beautiful 500 nit complete Co color coverage display. So I, just like I said with the carbon, the funny thing is when, when they said 100% color gamut, and I'm like, okay, well, which standard? sRGB, Adobe RGB, NTSC? They meant them all. This is a very good display, folks. If you can afford that $170 extra, go for it, because it's it's not going to make you wish for OLED anymore. The only thing you're going to lose on is contrast ratio, because nothing is, can beat OLED's perfect blacks. But in terms of color accuracy on this, uh, side viewing angles without having color shift, no worry about burn-in. I'll take this one any day. Besides that, you're getting Intel 8th generation CPUs. This is a big upgrade. We haven't seen such a big upgrade in performance from Intel CPUs in several generations. So we went from two cores to four cores for these 15 watt U series Ultrabook CPUs. They're still not as fast as mobile workstation 45 watt CPUs, even though some benchmarks running a short duration might make them look that way. But it's a heck of a lot of horsepower. It, it really is pretty impressive. And it's great for coders, for number crunchers, if you're doing Adobe Photoshop, even video editing. It's got the horsepower. You still just have Intel UHD 620 graphics, and that's someplace where Surface Book 2 obviously trumps it with GTX 1050 and 1060 graphics, depending on which size you go with there. But uh, for the, the, the folks that are being targeted with this, I suspect that it's going to be fine for business users, even if you're doing a lot of Photoshop, even if you're doing some 1080p video production and a little 4K, it's going to be okay. It's not for somebody who's a full-time video producer like me, for example. Ideally, we want something with dedicated graphics and all that, but you get the idea. It's a powerful machine. Even more interesting is the fact that 
they really let the thing run free. You know, there's not a lot of thermal and power throttling going on here, often with ultrabooks, particularly because they have to run in a 15 watt envelope and they're thin. So there's not much room for heat dissipation. You'll see throttling both for power and for thermal reasons. When we ran long-term benchmarks like PC Mark 8, which runs about a half an hour, so that's a good place to see how thermals are affected. You can see in the CPU graph right here how it stays clocked right at the top. Usually with Ultrabooks, we see the CPU going like this, up and down, up and down, and dropping down as often as it can. This one stayed pretty much locked at Turbo Boost at 4.1 gigahertz. Base clock speed is 1.9 gigahertz. Now the CPU cores would go as high as 96 degrees and centigrade, and 100 is maximum allowable. So the good news is they're not thermal throttling the the thing you might worry about is well that's getting a little close to thermal shutdown but you know in normal operation it's pretty darn hard to actually get it the CPU core is that high so overall I would say that's very good performance and you can see the benchmark graphs there it's performing as well as the Dell XPS 13 9370 which does some nifty little overclocking and over powering the CPU a little bit giving a little extra power to work with just so it can get higher performance this thing is matching it it's pretty pretty good stuff for performance PCIe NVMe SSDs are standard, and what that means is the fastest kind of M.2 SSDs you can put in a laptop. So that's good stuff right there. And also they're using the new Samsung PM981, one of the first laptops in the X1 Carbon, like I saw, said before, that I've seen actually using that drive. So great performance there as well. It has two USB-C Gen 2 slash Thunderbolt 3 ports, and it's a USB-C based charger as well. Now they have a anti-fry feature, as they call it, because, you know, there have been some dicey USB-C cables out there and even peripherals that sometimes could fry a port. This made big news a couple of years ago. So they have a little anti-fry technology to protect the laptop. Good news, Thunderbolt 3 here. You can use Thunderbolt 3 docks. You could even use an external GPU. And it's four lane, 40 gigabit per second. So it's not in any way hobbled there. I still don't think Ultrabooks are the best pairing with eGPUs for gaming, honestly. I mean, I would get a gaming laptop if I was really that into it, given the, the, the expense and all the stuff that you're getting involved with and still not having quite this core performance that you would with a gaming laptop, but hey, that one's up to you. Despite its skinniness, you have plenty of other legacy ports as well. You got USB-A with 3.1 on there, your headphone jack, you got HDMI, and, and Lenovo keeps going with that proprietary Ethernet adapter port for the optional dongle if you want to use that. Of course, you could use the USB-C Ethernet adapter if you wanted to as well. Headphone jack, sure, micro SD card slot. Yeah, just like with the X1 Carbon, you can get it with LTE A4G, and that's a Qualcomm Snapdragon X7 modem if you do that. And it's got a little door at the back side of it that is right next to the micro SD card slot for the nano SIM. It has stereo speakers with Dolby audio. Headphone audio is pretty good. The, the speaker audio, it's okay. It's, you know, with Lenovo, sometimes it can be pretty surprisingly awesome, or it can just be okay. This is okay in terms of the speaker quality. It's got a fingerprint scanner and it's supposed to be more secure because it's its own system on chip. So it encapsulates to fingerprint data. It's not exposed to the BIOS. You get the idea, idea there. It's got DTPM 2.0. You can get a Windows Hello IR camera, though you can't get that with the HDR display. I guess there's just not a room for, behind the bezel for that one. And if you don't like the traditional ThinkPad matte black, it is available in silver too for you crazy people out there who want to live a little. The keyboard on this, again, they call it the Wave keyboard. They used to call it the Lift and Lock. The keys actually recess all of them. They move down when you put it in convertible mode, be it tent mode or tablet mode, so you don't feel them wiggle. They get locked. It's a little less weird feeling than squiggly keys for the 360-degree convertible design. It's the same key travel as the ThinkPad X1 Carbon 6th Gen. It feels ever so slightly different because obviously it is a different keyboard mechanism there, but it's equally as good and is ever one of the best typing experiences you're going to find on the skinny Ultrabook. It's very ergonomic smile-shaped keys, backlighting in white, all the whole usual stuff there. Not noisy, not clacky, good damping. Oh, heavenly. It has Lenovo's usual eraser stick style track point pointer embedded in the keyboard, that little red nub in there, and you've got dedicated keys up top above the trackpad for that. And the trackpad itself is MS Precision certified, they say, and it has Lenovo's usual control panel for customizations of it. And it's a perfectly fine trackpad. Maybe a little on the stiff side, but other than that, it's a good trackpad. So there's three different display options. 
you've got your full HD 1920 by 1080. Obviously, all of these support touch and the Wacom AES pen that's included. There's a WQHD, which is 2560 by 1440. Also, IPS, both of those are 300 nit or our HDR option with Dolby Vision support. So wide, super wide color gamut there and 500 nits of claim brightness. And we measured almost that much. So it's incredibly bright. It's painfully bright if you're in a dark room, but it's fantastic if you're actually going to use this outdoors. If some people who buy ThinkPads do, because you're moving, doing construction projects or what have you, real estate, all those sort of things, you can see this outdoors. Despite the fact they call this an anti-glare display, it's a glossy display. So there is some glare involved there. The display panel, the part number is the exact same on the X1 Carbon 6th Gen that we just reviewed. And like I said, I'm, there's no reason to wish for OLED. Yeah, other than the contrast not being near infinite on it, none of the problems of OLED here, all the good goodness of IPS slash low temperature polysilicon, which is actually the technology they're using here. Great viewing angles on it, supremely wonderful colors. I'm really jazzed that they have this in what's called a business line product. But obviously the yoga also appears, appeals to artists, maybe even some video producers, that sort of thing, where you care about color accuracy. And the, the factory calibration was pretty good on this and you can calibrate it really nicely. And it's well suited for those of you who are still doing work for print, where you need that wider gamut, the full Adobe RGB coverage that's still used for print. So how about battery life? There's a 50 watt hour four cell battery, the usual sealed inside kind of deal, though you can unscrew the bottom and access it for service if you need to. Comes with a 65 watt charger, again, same one as the X1 Carbon, and uh, 65 watts so it can charge faster because Lenovo has their express charge. Charges very quickly. They say you can get up to 80% charge in an hour, and it's true. So that's pretty nice for somebody who really is traveling and on the go, need to get juiced up quickly, you can do it here. Battery life, they claim up to 15.4 hours. That's optimistic. I suppose you could do it, but in the real world, actually using productivity programs, MS Office, that sort of thing, doing your social media, some Adobe Photoshop, photo editing, those sorts of things, maybe some light coding, but not compiling a program that's millions of lines of code over and over again, because that will hit your CPU and reduce your battery life. It's, it's about... 10 hours or so, nine to 10 hours, which is pretty impressive for something with this bright a display. That's what the display set at 160 nits, which is reasonably bright for indoor use. If you max it out to 500 nits, obviously your battery life is gonna be shorter than that, but it's certainly respectable enough. So just as with the last generation and also with some recent Dell products too that have pens, this is Wacom AES. It's the latest generation, 4,096 levels of pressure sensitivity, a no tilt support on it for the pen. Mostly only artists care about that if you're using a tilt brush. And it, it's, it's a very good active capacitive solution. That's the technology behind it, where the pen is the active part. It, that's why it either has a battery or it gets charged, not the display. And you can see that things like the diagonal line jitter are greatly reduced. I'm really pretty impressed by this. And palm rejection is decent. It's never going to be as good as Wacom EMR because the hover distance isn't as good. See, it knows when to ignore your palm when it senses the pen tip. So if the pen tip is only sensed when you're just really close to the screen, this is why it doesn't know if you should pay attention to your hand or your palm. If you're an artist, wear an art glove. If you're taking notes, well, you look funny wearing a glove all the time, won't you? But you might have to, if you notice any little weirdnesses with any of these active non-Wacom EMR digitizers, it probably means you'd have to lift your pen up or make sure you put the pen tip down first before you rest your palm on the glass. That said, out of the way, I used it to continue on with this piece of artwork that I actually started on a Dell Latitude and I was very pleased with it. I really didn't go screaming for my Wacom EMR solution for doing artwork on this. It's pretty darn good, and given the fact that you can't get Wacom EMR in anything but a Wacom Mobile Studio Pro or Samsung laptops, and those are not even available in every country, you got to make do, don't you? So for note-taking, awesome. For art, pretty darn good. I like it a little bit better than entering still because of lower initial force of activation. You don't have to press so hard to get a line started on the screen. But other than that, well, Intrig and Wacom AES are pretty close. So I know some of you are trying to decide between this and Surface Book 2, and if you want that, just shout out in the comments and I can make a smackdown happen. Obviously, they're very different, yet overlapping machines, and the prices are even overlapping too there. So to take off the bottom cover, Phillips head screws, they're all visible right here. They're captive screws, so unscrew them so you feel them click and they'll stay in the cover here. Pop it off, and <laughs> there's a lot of plastic covering this, isn't there? So here you have your battery, right there, obviously. Stereo speakers over here, and under, behind door number one here, and door number two, we have some 
liberal use of plastic tape. The M2 SSD here in this little tinfoil cover for thermal reasons. I think they're putting some insulation there. And that's the Wi-Fi card. The RAM is soldered on board with this. There's our CPU, four screws for the heatsink, always a good thing, and a fan, not terribly a huge one, but it does seem to manage with cooling. It doesn't get too hot or too loud. It really didn't exceed human body temperature, the bottom or the top surfaces. So there it is, the third generation of the Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Yoga. Better every time for sure. This time that big jump in CPU power, thanks to Intel going from two cores up to four cores, means there's a significant jump in horsepower here. As ever, it's thin and light. Physically, it's not changed a whole lot from the last generation. The display, I know there were some of you who are really loving the idea of that OLED display last generation. I don't think you're going to be too sad with this year's HDR option. And with all the, the improvements that come with that, no worrying about burn-in, for example, no color shift from side viewing angles. It's pretty awesome. And Lenovo is already dropping the prices on these. Just since we reviewed the X1 Carbon last week, in fact, both the Yoga and the Carbon prices have come down. So it's not quite as mind-bogglingly -bogglingly expensive as it was. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.